Hej och välkomna tillbaka till kanalen. Eh, idag så har vi en liten specialare. Det är ju Ingmars hörna och vi har eh, Ramesh Shohan från Indien som eh, ska få eh, visa lite arbete som han har gjort med Erik Enby och sådär. Och så eh, häng gärna med i kommentarerna där och fråga frågor så kan ju Ingmar översätta när det är hans... Eh, Ja, när han tar över här. Uh, och så tänkte jag bara så här, nu jobbar jag lite i bakgrunden med kommentarer och såna här saker. Så jag lämnar över till Ingmar och så mm. går jag och gömmer mig. En stund. And because today we are a little bit international, we got Indian friends from Hyderabad, Ramesh Juan. And we got Glenn Dormer from Gävle and Canada. Uh, but the main guest today is Rameshwan, and we do this uh, program to honor the late Erik Enby. And please now check the mustache of Rameshwan, because he was in Sweden like 28 years ago. And check him together side by side with Erik Enby. So Linus, we make that small introduction film with Erik Enby and Ramesh Juan that was made for a congress in Montreal. Microbiologists and pathologists for long have been on the search for microbes that might be responsible for cancer. Many have reported on various bacteria and viruses associated with carcinoma cervix. In the present study, we report findings on cancer tissue using interference contrast microscopy. Our research began with my looking on blood from chronically diseased individuals 12 years ago. During that time, I could identify that the blood was contaminated by microbes, not described in the ordinary medical books. Eventually, I extended my studies to work with more solid tissues. One such example is tissue from carcinoma of the breast, which I expressed manually. The tissue was taken to the PET lab where it was identified as adenocarcinoma. However, interference microscopy of the same tissue showed large numbers of highly motile disc-shaped granules, similar to those found in the blood. Studies on carcinoma cervix has also revealed the same kind of organisms. Fresh cervical tissue obtained by biopsy from patients suffering from carcinoma cervix was placed on a glass slide. A cover slip was placed on the slide and the specimen teased by pressing with another glass slide. The mounted specimen was studied using a Light's Dialux interference contrast microscope at 1200 times magnification. The microscope was fitted with a Panasonic video camera. Observations were recorded on a JVC Umatic video recording system on a real time basis. Large number of highly motile disc-shaped granules of different sizes were observed. 
These granules were also found embedded in a cheese-like substance. Those embedded were non-motile. In early cancers, these granules were relatively smaller in size and the number of granules more, as compared to that of more advanced cancers. The moment of the granules were definitely not similar to Brownian moment, but similar to that seen in, ba in most bacteria. The granules appear to have no cell wall and are very resistant to various uh, substances like anti antibiotics, cytostatics and cytotoxic drugs. They have been found to survive even after the specimen was exposed to microwave in a domestic microwave appliance for 30 minutes. A comparison is made with Streptococcus and the observed organism to show similarity in movements. Note the extreme variation in size in the organism observed from the tissues of carcinoma cervix. In tissues obtained from advanced cancers, the granules were seen to be of enormous size and fewer in number compared to that of early cancer. It was also interesting to see mycelial-like growth in the tissues. Various organisms from viruses and onwards have been implied in cancer. Cancer of the cervix is no exception. However, the presence of organisms described here have not been reported so far. Cell wall deficient bacteria, L forms and polymorphic forms of microorganisms have been sparsely reported in literature and go unreported mostly because of their being considered as contaminants or as bacteria in early stages of formation. These forms are resistant to most known antibiotics, difficult to culture and pose a problem in therapy. The present reported organisms, although exhibit similar characters as L forms or cell wall deficient forms, appear in such large numbers that it is difficult to ignore. Interference contrast microscopy therefore appears to be a useful procedure not often done. It is also essential to recognize and further study the biochemical and ultrastructural characteristics of these organisms reported in our paper. Clinically, it becomes essential to find ways of dealing with these forms. It also becomes essential to find biological means rather than chemical means to cope with these organisms in particular and the whole human organism and the milieu in which we live. Mm -hmm. uh, a fantastic video and to the audience you, I would say this video was made 28 years ago September 1994 but what happened September 2022 uh, a lot of papers have appeared in the scientific press and in one of them a, a Bulgarian scientist has also brought your names up. Ramesh Shuan, 
and Eric Enby and find the history be, be beyond this research. So it's the honor of both Eric Enby and also of <laughs> somehow <laughs> Ramesh Schwan. So uh, Ramesh, now you are in Hyderabad, India. Yes. But I think you remember those days in Gothenburg. I was among them too. <laughs> uh, but could you tell me how did you find Eric Enby? How did you come over that you found his name? Well, that's that's going back into uh, into time. But you know, I I used to uh, do a lot of work with. Uh, Dr. Bernard Grad from McGill in Montreal, and uh, Dr. Douglas Dean, uh, and while, uh, while while we were there, Bernie Grad showed me the book, uh, you know, written by uh, Eric, Hidden Killers, and uh, then that started off a whole new discussion, because at that time we were also looking at various other, uh, you know, uh, principles of life. Um, we were trying to figure out what was going on in terms of, you know, uh, human uh, biology versus standard understanding and the the uh, parapsychological understanding of the of human life itself. You know, uh, Douglas Dean was a very very well known uh, researcher bernie grad was called as the official officially called as a father of healing research in Mont you know, in canada he was at uh, mcgill so you know rubbing shoulders with such people i i was pretty young but somehow you know i kind of got in, into a, a different world um, so as soon as i uh, came across uh, this book the next thing I did was from Canada, I called up Eric, went straight into Goldberg, met him, and uh, you know, half a day with him was more than enough. I decided that I had to go headlong into uh, into continuing with what uh, Eric has been doing. Now the problem is in. Sweden, you did not have in those days. There was, you didn't have the variety of cancers and the the numbers of specimens you could get, as compared to what I could get in India. Uh, you know, so I came back to India, back to the hospital where I was working. Uh, you know, I would take samples and then fly from uh, India to Sweden. Uh, the, the, the beauty is, or beauty was, that there were no borders at that time. You know, uh, the, there were no restrictions. Today, imagine trying to carry tissues across the uh, country borders. People were more free in sharing. That was how this whole thing was possible. I, I'll just have to tell you one small anecdote here. Since I was carrying tissues and these tissues had to be kept frozen, I, I used to carry them in ice packs. And when I board a flight, usually it was British Airways and KLM. These are the only two airlines I would travel. The air hostesses, such beautiful souls, they would ask me, they says, hey, doc, you know, have you got anything for the fridge? And say, yes, you know, here's this box. And they would take it and put it for me in the freezer for the whole flight. Now, imagine such things happening in today's time, no, sir. Even flight sharing people, they all disappeared. You know. Now, coming back to Eric, uh, staying there with Eric, working on these tissues, trying to figure out what those organisms that we were seeing were, you know, that, that, that itself is, is a whole new thing. Interference contrast microscopy dark field microscopy they were still they were taught in the medical schools that yeah you know I, there's something called dark field there's something called interference contrast but beyond uh, a, a passing mention 
there was no serious, uh, you know, teaching, no serious work. Even at even at the specialization level for microbiologists, that was not their routine. So, so I was thrilled to be able to work uh, with Eric, uh, you know, because he had with him the microscopes, uh, he had the equipment, uh, and all that required was me rushing back to India, picking up tissues, coming back, and then studying them. You know, those were days. Those were good days. And uh, then, of course, the we got the information about this World Congress of uh, you know Obstetrics and Gynecology, 1994, that was being organized in Montreal. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with an organization called the uh, called FIGO, uh, Federation International Gynecology and Obstetrics. Uh, world body for all the obstetricians and gynecologists, the World Association. And they were hanged there, uh, you know, their, their conferences are once in three years. So uh, the 94 conference, we were, uh, we said, why don't we try exposing, you know, presenting what we have to people and see how they react. So Eric and I, we flew into, uh, uh, into Montreal for this gathering. Uh, we had the same video was actually made for that. Uh, when it was played, there was pin drop silence and complete disbelief. People looked at it, and when when everything was over, nobody even had a question to ask because it was total disbelief. They were looking at us as two aliens, probably you know, <laughs> coming from whichever world they were. And uh, but anyway, that that was that was the beginning. And, and then started people who uh, came into uh, you know into the uh, persecution side. They wanted to label us as mentally unstable. They wanted to label us as uh, saying you know that we were bringing in bad science. They were not willing to agree that everything is not yet understood and revealed. You know, so. Uh, and obviously, application of that directly into patient care was a problem. You know, uh, we had uh, restrictions. Uh, you couldn't help them because there was already establishments and you just could not go beyond the establishments. It was a tough time. And, uh, the, you know, we, we did because we believed. We believed that nature is not as simple as we want to make it. Uh, you know, organisms are there. A lot of those organisms we still do not know. We were not aware. Because after all, if you look at it, what is the lifespan of a human? Well, maximum 100 years. Whereas what is the lifespan of the universe itself? Billions of years. So this 100, 100 years that we claim we have, understanding what is there for over a billion years is not possible but we do not want to accept that reality you know so that's that's how uh, it was and now when i saw your email about uh, eric and my work being referenced in an article you know it, it kind of brought back a lot of memories uh, what is sad is that eric is no more Otherwise, this would have been a really proud day for him, you know, a day where he would have felt, yes, whatever sufferings we went through in our belief, whatever we had, uh, you know, done, it is all well worth it because at least now people started, you know, realizing and accepting it. We were like toddlers in those days, right? I mean, a lot of things have come in, a lot of technology has come in place now lot more understanding on uh, the uh, on the fact that human body is not sterile because those days when we when we first made an announcement saying the body is not sterile that it has even in the fetal body okay even in the fetus that there are microbes people didn't want to accept it their, their, their belief was the body the fetal body was absolutely sterile only after delivery bacteria or whatever would then get in 
from that concept or when, when that was really rampant, we said no. Even at the fetal level, there are microbes and this whole human body is nothing but a conglomeration of both human and non-human tissues. Now that in those days was a profound statement. Yes. Now we have understood, you know, you know, what, what is it? A human body, an average human body is something like, you know, uh, a couple of trillions of uh, human cells and uh, about 49% are human cells and 51%, if you do the cell count, 51% are non-human origin, are non-human cells. And that's what makes up a human body. Now, people are accepting the fact. They brought in a new term called the microbiome. And then they came in with the thing that, yes, it is absolutely important for the human and non-human life forms to be working in tandem, working together. And that is how health is maintained. Yes, Ingama. Oh, uh, but I learned it that the Montreal experience for you, it wasn't the first time you was a pioneer in science. Before, uh, as a young, even as a young student, or as the start of your um, uh, uh, work in the laboratory, you made, came over and made a hypothesis about stem cells long <laughs> before we learned that word here in Western world. Can you tell a little about it? You are laughing this, but something odd happened together with that one. Yes, uh, you know, you see, we knew that there was, uh, my, my introduction to, uh, to all of this comes through, uh, you know, uh, a little uh, divergence into what is called as the human aura. And uh, trying to understand what the whole thing is about, trying to understand the light emissions from the human body. Uh, of course, today, a lot of people have taken that into uh, non-science from science. A beautiful thing has been killed. But anyway, so we were trying to figure out what, and, and that was basically because Cancer was difficult to pick up in its early stages. I'm talking, even today, it's still difficult. We, even today, we do not have real non-invasive methods of identifying cancer very, very early. And, uh, you know, in, in, in the late uh, 70s and early 80s, it was even worse. So you had to go in for uh, an intervention. So... That was when the concept of picking up the light being emitted by the human body, the photo activity of human cells uh, gave me a lot of, uh, you know, so we started looking at them. But then as part of that, we also had to bring in, uh, you know, uh, electric currents, electric fields to uh, enhance these photo emissions, modify it, whatever. While I was doing that work, I realized that electric fields can actually influence tissues. It can, you know, already we know that there's a lot of electrical activity in the body. Uh, Bob Becker had done studies on that uh, already. Things. But uh, a lot of that was still not accepted in mainstream medicine, that electricity plays a role in body physiology. That was not accepted then. If now slowly it is coming in. So... While we were, uh, you know, while I was actually trying to stimulate individual cells, I noticed a very strange phenomenon that differentiated cells, human cells, okay, differentiated human cells could become de-differentiated or undifferentiated. That means, you know, they would go back to a stage where in those days we could, the only term we used was embryonic cells or totipotent cells. So from an adult cell, which is supposed to be, you know, uh, specialized to a cell which could just, you know, a differentiated cell going back into a state of de-differentiation. The only part is even cancer cells were de-differentiated. So that gave me more and more impetus to study. 
you know, how to make the cells go back to being embryonic. And then came the idea, if they could go back to being, you know, to that embryonic state or de-differentiated state or totipotent state, then there should also be a way of bringing them back. And guess what? Electrical frequencies, electromagnetic fields could actually, you know, give guide them back into becoming different tissues. My, uh, the, 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 my, I started off with cervical uh, squamous cells, skin cells from the cervix, got them de-differentiated, and then selectively re-differentiated them into, uh, you know, nerve cells, bone cells, muscle cells. Obviously, nobody believed it, although they were looking at these cells under the microscope. All right? The transformation itself, they could actually see under the microscope. But even then, seeing was not believing. And, uh, you know, so I, I had faced this, uh, you know, uh, situations right from my early uh, medical school days, probably as a, as a medical student itself, you know, uh, when people would disbelieve and ridicule. And, but eventually, stem cells did come into existence. You know, in, in, in my lab, I had a, a, a big poster created where I said, one day you could take stem cells, make your own organs instead of depending on, on, you know, on, on donors. And if you could do that, then organ rejection could be, uh, you know, a, a, a story of the past because if you can make organs from the same individual and put back, there's nothing like it. There's no question of rejection. But, you know, in those days, as I said, again, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, they were all uh, still probably more of science fiction than reality. But uh, I feel humble, basically, to, 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 uh, to see that within my own lifetime, you know, those things being changed, being accepted, being brought back into, uh, into treatment lines gives a lot of satisfaction. Yeah, you know, I, I may not have uh, made a commercial success. I may not have uh, become, uh, you know, whatever uh, well-known figures. But, you know, now in the, uh, as I ripen in my age, to look back and say, yes, all those, you know, uh, escapades from mainstream medicine that I did are proving to be true and, you know, they are being accepted. So, yeah. So the aura, studying the aura, doing, you know, uh, changes and then creating stem cells. And then, of course, you know, making a claim that cancer is an electrical default in the body. Uh, and cancer cells are nothing but, you know, defective cells to saying that, you know, uh, microbes play a role. They were all new things in those days, yes. Uh, I think about, uh, there is one question for you down there, but you can also go to Glenn if you want to answer. But I was thinking about the last line of that video when uh, Pasteur said on his deathbed, the milieu is everything, the microbes, nothing. You can't kill the microbes in the normal way uh, uh, doctors think. But you can change the environment for them so they starve to death or yes. their potential as pathogens goes away. Uh, but yeah. you, Ramesh, you act as a doctor these days. Yeah, I'm, I, I, maybe, I, maybe you could, uh, and because you're still that fighter, you want the, to see your patients leave you as healthy persons. So can you tell a little about what are you allowed to do in India? What are okay. you not allowed to do? But maybe you still do it to help there in the best way. Okay. Uh, as far as I uh, know, uh, your sticking to a particular line of treatment is concerned. Now we have more and more regulations coming in where if you're a trained modern medicine doctor, you cannot deal with any other uh, method of health uh, uh, health care, if you want to call that. In fact, they can book you under what is called as cross-pathy. That means, you know, we are, 
most most people don't realize that the word allopathy itself is actually a slur, an insult uh, designed by the homeopath. Uh, <laughs> so, but then we feel proud saying, "Oh, we are, we, are, we are allopaths." So, an allopath cannot prescribe anything beyond allopathy. You cannot talk about uh, natural remedies. You cannot prescribe homeopathic medicines. Nothing. But then there's always a cross road that you, you, you are standing on where if you are uh, concerned about your patient and what's happening in front of you, you will start questioning yourself. Well, do I follow the protocol and you know uh, just let the patient face whatever is in their a, a beautiful world called, a word called fate? Okay. So if it is their fate to suffer, they will, if it is in their fate to recover, they will recover, but I will stick to my protocol. This is what most people do. But then there still are a number of people, uh, you know, like me and like Eric, we were concerned more about a patient's well-being than our own personal well-being. So we were looking at, at, at possibilities, what is there? that could help my patient. Now in that, today I have a beautiful way. I say, go back to food, you know, because a lot of our, a lot of our medicines are actually available in everyday foods. One example I'll tell you, salvestrol or, or you know, uh, an anti-cancer drug, uh, you know, resveratrol, an anti-cancer drug, not commonly available, not still uh, things, but you know, your, your, your everyday grape seed and grape skin has tons of it, enough to actually bring a sick patient out of cancer. There's enough. So now, instead of saying, well, you know, uh, we have to get this or get that, I simply tell them, look, let's do the diet way. And it's easy also, you know, at the end of the day, look at it. Food is all that is essential. This body is nothing but food body. We don't give anything else beyond food. So if this body is food body, something wrong with the food you give to the body will actually reflect itself in terms of how the body is performing. And if something has gone wrong with the body, naturally food is a first step to rebalancing that imbalance. Fortunately, most of the drugs, most of the cancer drugs are available in everyday foods. You have to just look around and give them the right kinds. You know, luteolins, uh, you know, uh, catechins. Uh, there's a range of available, well-studied, documented anti-cancer molecules, but not predominantly available simply because they cannot be synthesized in the lab. Nature provides them. You have them in nature. Question is, again, have you the guts to get them? And can you really camouflage and give so that, you know, a patient can get the benefit at the same time you're not under the uh, clutches of uh, regulations? You know? Yeah, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Ramesh a question about uh, you named can cell, which is also called protocell, which also is called the uh, enterev drug. En en uh, uh, this idea that you can uh, treat cancer cells with uh, a voltage difference. So yes. when they come when they come to this differentiated embryonic stage, that by the volt by taking a protocell or a can cell that you can force them to uh, implode. It, in fact, so yes, we did that. The, yeah, and in, and, in, uh, in, in the in the late in the mid eighties in the mid eighties I introduced a, a method. Not only me. In fact, uh, the pioneer of using electricity in treating cancers was John Nordenstrom, the radiologist from none other than Karolinska. Mm -hmm. I met with him. Yeah, we did a lot of work. We were there. I, I you know, I, I, I've spent some lovely moments with John. 
and yes, you know, we and then I came back to India uh, and started uh, using what what I termed as microelectric currents in treatment of cancers. Okay, so yes, uh, during those days we had to put an electrode into the body, but now we have ways of actually sending these, you know, the, the electric fields into the body without actually piercing the body. Yeah, the, the protocell or cancel method, which is established, I don't know, 15 plus years ago, is that you take a tablet every four to six hours to change the, uh, the the potential across the cell wall and it affects of some of some specified uh, specific reason it affects cancer cells even more than healthy cells and what happens is that these cancer cells they die when you take this treatment for about two or three weeks uh, this i've read a couple of books by people uh one is sven uh, sven eric nordine Mm -hmm. And he cured his, um, he had penile cancer with uh, metastasis to the, uh, the inguinal region, the uh, 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 lower becket. And he actually, this is a true story. I read his book just a few days ago. He cured his cancer uh, through uh, 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 vitamins, uh, 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 trace elements, and this protocell. So it does work for him. Oh, it does. It, it, it does. In, in fact, now there's a UK entity called Cellsonics, which is, uh, you know, they have this beautiful little device, works like your ultrasound machine, but also actually pumps in electric uh, currents inside. And we have seen tumor reductions using Cellsonics. Uh, you know, I had, I had some amazing results with the Cellsonic machine. Uh, of course, uh, I also have a little st small story to it, uh, you know, uh, David is a guy who actually brought it, the, the, the founder of Cellsonics. They came back, says, hey, doc, you remember you conducted a, a workshop in, uh, uh, in, in, in Yugoslavia on, uh, on, on using microelectric currents. Uh, but those days you were actually, you know, piercing needles into the body uh, to connect. And uh, we have done this system uh, based on your uh, ideas and your work. We have devised this machine where you don't have to pierce the body anymore. So, and, and, you know, and now we see some amazing results with uh, a lot of cancers. Now, Cellsonics is based on the UK. One of the questions is we're talking a little bit about cancer now, and, and Eric Andy was very interested in cancer and and and. I've been uh, at his home in Dalarna here in Sweden and uh, together with uh, Ingemar and uh, Nita and Marianne. And he, he showed us uh, quite, it was amazing what he showed us on his microscope. He had very, very good home microscopes. And yes, this is the book I was talking about. I had another question, Ramesh, very quickly. Yep. Amygdalin. Have you heard of amygdalin, also called um, uh, laetrile, also called vitamin B17? The idea of the cyanide molecule being released only in cancer cells, and uh, because there's a there's a um, an oxidase uh, in cancer cells that isn't uh, present in regular cells. Just wondering if you have you if you've uh, stumbled across amygdalin at all. Look, I have come across amygdalin. I have read a few uh, articles on amygdalin, uh, but personally, you see. Calling it as a vitamin is wrong because, you know, there are certain criteria for any molecule to be called or labeled. So I think that's the first mistake they made, calling it as vitamin B17 and trying to push into the people. A lot of work has to be done, uh, you know, because, yes, uh, the electrical pathways of how enzymes work in normal cells and abnormal cells are already now coming out. We know a lot of these pathways. We know those enzymes can be, you know, uh, influenced. And most easiest thing to influence is enzymes is, again, proteins. So, personally, do I have any experience using amygdalin? No, I have not given to anybody myself. Uh, what is my personal opinion on amygdalin based on all my research so far? Well, you still have to do uh, enough uh, work to show the pathways how it is actually influencing 
and then yes you can do it uh, you know i i'm open to i'm open to looking at anything in it and and everything as long as there is at least some science in it you know uh, you you can bring the weirdest of idea i wouldn't mind looking at it as long as there is some logic to it and 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 something because you know everything is not known even today a lot of uh, a lot of things that are happening in the universe are not known to us not explainable so there's still a lot of room that openness you have to have uh one last uh, question or point is uh a man here in Sweden by name of Lars Ben Lars mm -hmm. Bern uh he's uh over 70 and very well read in many areas uh including medically he's not a I don't think he's a, no he's not a doctor but he's very well read and he asked the question about Eric Enby's work he said how do we find out if these microbes and uh, 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 swamp uh, uh, fungi, fungi uh, how do we know if they came after the tissue was you could say infected by cancer and started to degrade or were they there be and were part of the cause of the cancer that kind of the chicken and egg question as he put it how do we know if these microbes and 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 um mycosis were there mycosis was there before the cancer started or did they invade the cancerous tissues afterwards so just that that's my last point or question okay well if, if if you if you now accept that the body is not sterile sterile that there are microbes even in fetuses which is now being you know agreed accepted more and more evidence is coming in that means these microbes have been there in a symbiotic manner something within their internal environment has changed and i believe mostly it is uh, in terms of you know electrical environment uh, it's pH balance. These are two critical things. When that happens, especially if you look at the cell membranes, you see the way any cell functions, the first function is eating, the second function is growing. Now, if you look at how cells eat, various molecules have to go into the cell. And how do they go? They go through little openings on the cell wall or, or the cell membrane. These openings or gates are actually controlled through electric potentials. All right. Now, pH, alkalinity, acidity also contributes to the electrical variations. Abnormal cells or cancer cells we now know have a different electric potential compared to normal cells. It's now already established. So whatever has caused these changes also have a similar effect on the symbiotic microbes resulting in the microbes also changing probably that's what is happening and uh, so then did the did did these microbes cause cancer or they are also ordinary microbes affected by their you know milieu changes because of which they started ab reacting i tend to believe that that could be the possibility because you know another thing is genetics if you look at it i have i have a very very simple question i ask a lot of friends of mine who are geneticists you know our body started with just one half of one cell from the father one half of one cell from the mother so it's just this one single cell throughout its existence in the uterus no other cells come and join okay so after differentiation after the tissues formed everything has happened where which particular cell has then brought in this new dna which you call as you know the 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 genetic uh, material that is responsible for the cancer. My take is the genetic changes that we see are a result of the cell becoming 
deviant in its functioning. It's not the genetic uh, you know, change which causes a cell to change its function. It's the cells change in, in the, the change in cells function, which is being reflected as a change in the DNA also. Okay. Otherwise, where has that come from? If you say, yeah, we started our body with, you know, 20 different cells and one cell had a, a, a genetic issue and that then stayed on and over the years it started fine. But that didn't happen. We started with only one single cell. Uh, my, I changed the subject a little. My daughter Anna, she's very interested in uh, the hemp and the possibilities out of hemp. And one, uh, one thing with the hemp is their ability to be used uh, in medicine, either with the THC or without. Uh, they're still called. CBD oils. Uh, uh, can you tell us? I think we, me and Glenn, know the status in Sweden. They are mainly illegal, but some part of it we can use. What is the legal status in India? Or, or and have you got some experience or knowledge, uh, especially in uh, treating cancer with CBD? Well, if you if you look at legalities, using cannabis even for medical uh, use is illegal. Uh, yes, in the US and Canada and certain other countries, under the name of medical marijuana, it is used, it's, it is made uh, partly legal, or, or for most parts actually legal, because recently I think uh, Thailand has made it completely legal to use cell hold, but in India it is completely illegal. Now, having said that, medical uses of CBD, I do have experience. I have my patients in other parts of the globe where it is legal. And uh, I had some amazing results uh, with uh, CBD oil. Yes, in fact, you require both the CBD and THC uh, for it to be more effective in cancers. And uh, I, uh, I, I have PET scans of patients, you know, before, uh, you know, CBD and uh, three months after. Okay. Uh, now, mind you, these are patients who had already gone through the mill. They have gone through uh, surgeries, radiations, chemotherapies, and then they still had these huge masses of tumors in their body. And all the, uh, you know, uh, medical oncology hospitals have given up on them saying well you have a month to live you have maybe you know two weeks to live and those people because there's nothing else i had uh, the chance of putting them onto cbd and four months down the line five months down the line pet scans show that those tumors have disappeared or partly disappeared you know well that being the case, you still need medical regulations, uh, you know, uh, legalese. Otherwise, most doctors would not want to come out of the box and start using something which is not legal, which is, you know, which is going to put them into, in, 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 uh, into a different spot. Uh, so that's, that's the biggest problem. So question is, is CBD, in my personal experience, CBD is wonderful for cancer both in terms of, you know, uh, as an anti-cancer drug, as well as, you know, uh, painkiller and uh, mood elevator. Yes, all in one. It's an amazing drug, as long as you get the right one, the right quality. And uh, a lot of studies, mostly the, le the, the legality of it has to be worked out. And, you know, in medicine, especially what you call as organized medicine, to break barriers and bring in unorganized becomes a problem. Otherwise, nothing. In fact, uh, I guess we need we need two parallel movements. One movement where they establish more and, and document more and more and show the benefits. 
And the second movement is people saying, hey, you know, uh, we have to have a certain control on our body. After all, it is my life, my body. And if I'm not responsible for uh, maintaining it, who else should be responsible? You know, funny part is society today has moved away from, has shifted the responsibility from the individual to, you know, an organization, a collective. So the collective organization, the beneficiaries of this handing over of uh, power to maintain health have somehow, you know, got boxed into their own world. Yes, not intentionally, but, you know, circumstances drive them, economic, social, various lot of things. And they want to hang on to that. So we need to be able to get out of the box. We need to have we need to have people thinking out of the box and saying, "Hey, you know, that's fine. Legalities are fine, but there has to be exceptions. And if I choose, then I should be given the right to choose." Uh, speaking about choosing, uh, we've just come out of the so-called COVID era. What do you think about uh, modern vaccines that are that are produced in only six months? Uh, do you have any opinions about that? Opinion about about uh, these vaccines that were uh, oh, the produced vaccines. In, in only six months, as opposed to five years to fifteen years for all other vaccines known to the medical profession. Suddenly, uh, there were several countries that came out: AstraZeneca and Pfizer and Moderna and J and J and Sputnik and Sinovac. They all came out within six months. And I'm just wondering, what do you think about mod so-called modern vaccines and their efficacy and their safety? Well, as far as the uh, Corona vaccines are concerned, yes, the the uh, the governmental stand is they're all tested it's all wonderful honky dory but uh officially i should not be saying this but personally when i look at all those people who've been vaccinated i've i'm seeing a lot of a lot of pain we had already we had actually predicted that this would happen because you know uh, especially the spike protein and what uh, happens with the uh, protein metabolism uh, you know, even even as the uh, as, as vaccines just came out, we started questioning uh, on, on, in, in terms of not just efficacy, but more in terms of, you know, how are you handling a virus is a different, uh, a virus is a different entity. A bacterium is a different entity. You know, the, the whole concept that you can actually eliminate viruses from the body once they're in, inside you. I only have to laugh at it, you know, because a virus, in order to propagate itself, will have to become part of that particular individual cell, part of the DNA or the RNA, depending on what it is. So once it becomes part of it, how to remove it without killing that cell? All right. So. Well, well that, oh, that, that is one big question. I still, nobody had answered me in the, in, in the right manner. Now, as far as the vaccines are concerned, they say, oh, we have now artificial, uh, you know, intelligence. We have, uh, you know, uh, various, uh, you know, logarithms and uh, we could do all kinds of things. But when I see the ground reality, of course, political understandings are different. People's sufferings are different. So ground reality, I see a lot of people with a lot of problems coming in. What I see today is a tremendous increase in cancers and the tremendous speed at which cancers spread post-vaccinations. Uh, I also see a lot of, you know, uh, heart problems, cerebral, cerebral vascular accidents cardiovascular accidents we see a lot of them coming young people dying of heart attack Never most of them are vaxxed most Never of the people die. young people dying of heart attacks have had the so-called covid vaccine yes yes 
Yes. Mm. There is a question for us, the three of us, or at least for you, Ramesh. Uh, because me and Glenn, we wrote an article where we compared almost all European countries. And those countries in Europe, the majority of them, where they have injected people in a, a large number, two to three uh, injections, where they have uh, the childbirth rates have gone fallen extremely much whereas for example bulgaria and uh, romania where people re uh, said no to the vaccine very few took the vaccine they had the normal birth rates this 2022 have you any idea about any states in india or the country as yeah. such or miscarriage and we think it is uh, the number of miscarriages has gone up uh, also. Well, you see, in two things, I will be labeled as anti-Indian, but I don't care. Uh, you know, because uh, you say they, they say you cannot talk ill about your own country, but if you want to talk about science, you want to talk about humanity at large. Then, as I said, a lot of these things go unreported but we do see them. Mm. I've been seeing them. Okay. I've been seeing them. You know, see, I have never seen cancer spread extensively within three months. Okay. In three months, it has overtaken the whole body. That is something I've never seen before the, before the COVID era. Uh -huh. So, so called turbo cancers. Yeah. Turbo cancer. So a, a doctor in Sweden has been looking at that, especially in breast and uh, ovaries. Yes. I mean, see, we had HRCTs done, you know, uh, three, four months earlier. Nothing, nothing to be seen. And all of a sudden, four months down the line, person comes with cancer spread all over the body especially in the lungs, in three months, what has happened? HRCT should have shown something, nothing. So that means, you know, the only, the only thing is Corona, whether it's the virus, the vaccine, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So yes, you, th th there are a large number of people who love the vaccines, who are of their own goodness and good faith. I, I don't want to call them as anti-humanity people. They do it in good faith, but then you know, they become partly blinded. Well, they will say, no, no, you guys, you're, you're all anti-vaccine guys. You are basically blinded. That's fine. You know, we all we all have opinions, and let us have, let us agree to disagree. You know, there's a very old famous quote: "Let us agree to disagree." Only then progress will be made. Uh, Ramesh, have you? I take a question from the audience. Uh, do you have any experience of colloidal silver or nano silver? I think we colloidal talked silver. about it and we saw each other some years ago. Yes, mm. colloidal silver, sil silver as such, is a known, you know, antiviral antibiotic. Mm. It's been used for a long, long time. And, and mm. you know, nano silver, for example, in India, mm. it's been there as part of the healthcare, uh, you know, uh, uh, conundrum. It's, yes. So, <clears throat> colloidal and, silver, oh. if used appropriately, is good. The problem mm. is when you actually start loading yourself with silver, <clears throat> or for that matter, you know, any of the metals. The, 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 the negative part takes over. Otherwise, colloidal silver, colloidal gold has been part of, you know, the uh, uh, treatment regimens in the earlier healthcare uh, traditions in India. Mm. So it, you have uh, experience 2000 yeah. years uh, ago from <laughs> that long in Ayurvedic medicine. Mm. Nice. <laughs> Thank you.
Men, ja. eh, thank you, Ramesh, eh, Shohan och eh, Glenn Dormer och Ingmar. Eh, now I'm gonna speak in Swedish. And uh, I think you are uh, very welcome back anytime if you want to discuss uh, um, some topics. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, but now we're going to talk Swedish again. We are going to end here. So thank you for today. We can uh, see each other backstage afterwards. Uh, we have ended the broadcast. The four of us, we stay in the studio, but we say goodbye to the audience. Okay, yeah. great. Mm. Yes. Uh, då tackar vi tittarna som har uh, kollat här ikväll. Uh, hoppas att det... Take, take, a, take a nice song from you, Linus. You are from Nej. the West Coast. Men jag har, inte, jag har inte mina grejer på hårdisken. Allt är borta. Take the guitar. Take the guitar. Behind your back. <laughs> Do it. Okay. Like that. Are we still live? Uh, are we still uh, live? Uh, okay. Yes. I, don't know if, I don't know if Ramesh wants to talk to these two questions. One of them is about uh, 5G. If he, he believes that the added uh, rate of cancers and these turbo cancers or the just the increased prevalence of cancers, especially among young people, is some way related to the fact that they're turning on the 5G around the world. And the second question was about um, about uh, dehydro um, ascorbate. Uh, if there's any advantage to people that want to have vitamin C, if they take a kind of vitamin C which has been uh, oxidized. I, I personally do not have any experience with, uh, you know, uh, dehydroascorbate. Uh, also, availability in India is not there, so I cannot talk much about it. Now, as far as 5G is concerned, yes, there's, the you know, even at 2G level and 3G levels, there have been enough studies to show that they are harmful. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I mean, yes. even powerful. You have a public discussion more, about that in India. So, you know, mm. uh, we have to do enough. In Sweden, there is no studies. In Sweden, there is no public discussion about the dangers of 5G. It's only uh, among the alternatives. But in India, I saw the, even the mainstream media in India discuss 5G, a threat or uh, something good. No, they only talk about it as good. In fact, just, just the day before yesterday, I was at uh, at at, at uh, uh, an, uh, you know a climate change conference. Uh, you know, it was mostly mostly the uh, Middle East uh, countries. About forty countries were there participating in that, and I talked about electro pollution and uh, with, with with the with the cell phones, the cell towers. And your, you know, overhead cables causing this new, uh, uh, you know, situation called electropollution. The health hazards of it, you know. Uh, people are just do not want to believe it, although they suffer. They, once I'm off the podium, they come and say, yes, sir, I, you know, I, I have this, I feel this. But officially, nobody wants to acknowledge it. So, you know. We are still in that uh, very volatile uh, situation as far as all the business. Uh, and, and the media would only want to throw the government line. Therefore, you know, uh, they only talk about good things about it. Thank you to the audience. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. <laughs> I, 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 I am honored. <laughs> Yeah.